dog's body. It happened just after we did what we did. Afterwards, paired cinders pinned their glows on a dark aftermath, the room's black mat. But who in this world will love the atheist? It depends. Now I must get something off my chest, which, for example, a certain pair of God-fearing hands slowly finger-licked just this week past. How can anyone pull one's breath in at behest of God knowing he's a he? Like him, my love won't answer the phone. Just like God, he's really got it going on. You'd think it'd take me days to elaborate on his particular beauty, to ask the moon for favors, yet again lend its light. Well, it's excruciating. I'm sick of nature's pawn shop. Yet, let's trade in a few of his holy activities. My intent is not to be sarcastic. Digging small fossils up from out remote riverbeds, standing lonely and sage within the frame of sun-groped pastorals, and twanging his voice at words the same way burrs attached to a pants leg, or catch at the fur of dogs lost to the imperial immediacy of scent, and are thus lost entirely to the voice that is the leash of a god lover, a dog lover, for he loves a lost dog as any opposite god does. But it does no good to imagine him when my god, my dog, is dying. It does no good, I mean, because of the because. My dog happens to be dying. My reverse god, my good as dead dog. His peculiar glistening eyes are now lighting up on me, sitting beneath the window, black with lack of light. The lit room, casting its appalling theater, set back at the two of us. For, thank the god that gave me my dog. Even my fearsome and fearful love must admit, will he yet confess? He will not have me, atheist. When it happened, it must have happened after we did what we did. I made a mistake asking him what he believed in, the lousy specter of it. Am I such a masochist that I come to fall in with a Christian? I always swore to myself I'd never use the word cunnilingus in a poem. Yes, promised myself I'd never become so clinical, so cynical. And I imagine he must raise a god before him as one daily lifts a shirt, unfolds it from out a dresser drawer. What's his pants? Hey, what's your face, you dumb blue-eyed trembler, your tragedy constantly undertaking, its making and unmaking? How comes it to be that what you believe is incarnate? Is it him? Did he allow you to allow yourself to allow my mouth to let its throng stroke sleek against your, plumbed, your plumed throat? How can I find where the why resides that says you won't ever again? God, there's a dying man in my bed. How can you expect anyone to forgive? My dog is dead. So, so I have a whole bunch of um, poems that are um, they're, they're about high school, and um, I'm going to start out actually, which I don't normally do, with, um, with the one that actually initiated the whole idea for the sequence. I went, I, I went on a, a trip, a three-week trip to China with my college, and um, we visited a lot of schools. And um, so I, went, I was in a high school in Suzhou, and um, that was when I was like, wow, high school really is hell everywhere. Um, so like I was like, it's a universal thing that we go through. And um, so, and then there's, I, I have no sense of the order of this. And um, it happened when, um, when, okay. So this poem is called um, High School in Sujo, if I ever find it. And this is, is embarrassing, in fact. Lame, lame. Here we go. Um, high School in Sujo. They play ping pong. They are all boys. They play ping pong ceaselessly in the vast gymnasium. Will not stop the glance at us visitors from the west. Will not untie their eyes from the tiny ball. The principal of the school, salamandered slick hair, is displeased the visiting professors are female, leads us out from the gymnasium with silent loathing to a mentholated room inside which a haze plexiglass cage contains a stiff leopard, so frankly dead its fur looks as if it'll fall off from the stroke of our glance. I have to pee, 
In the girls' room, I squat where thousands of girls have squatted, the rich minerals wafting up from the toilet's well. Imagine how all of our urine moves through the mysterious pipes below, leaves the high school, depositing itself into the river that days later I'll move along with a throng of idiots I've joined to crawl this country as fleas do a dog. We visit one scholar's garden after another. Here's the garden of the master of nets, the broxar, bones of the earth. The furniture is referred to as internal organs. Gardens are traditionally entered through a narrow passage. Scholars were not girls. Girls are not scholars, though. Girls are gardens entered through a narrow passage. The girls at the textile factory tour do not look up. The guide snorts. We have no conception how lucky they are to have attained these jobs. It's only natural they wear masks to protect their lungs. In high school, I was the master of endless failures, thrashed nightly on bed, on the verge of coughing my lungs out in that garden of spitting up. Didn't every girl have her garden? The garden of jutting neck bones, gardens pocked with black eyes, the garden of letting him in despite many protests. A dead leopard relentlessly sheds its fur above an auditorium of children hurtling toward adulthood. In that gymnasium, there were no girls playing ping pong. They are all boys, ceaselessly. This poem is called High School as a Dead Girl. High school was us and we. We learned our grammar there. Became devised by bell sawing halls sharp as number two pencils. We grew thin, grew dark as men in its hallways. We grew up on men, our breasts their beards, their beards our breasts. While we cracked open beer cans in the girls' room, swug down foam minutes before walking into homeroom. I was known to be dumb, detentioned, a kill myself kind of girl. But it was you who shot herself in the head. What kind of girl shoots herself in the head? You want a quality kill? Take some sleeping pills, spare your mother the blood grief. You always took the hit for me, turned around in your seat. Did you hear what they said? Yes, some of us are intending to go to college. Lose our grief. Then the tarry hot of the parking lot rose up, black, promising me any boy's face, bent to crack against my face that was becoming a face. When we wanted only what we wanted, to be pretty, which then meant famous. I want to read a poem that I haven't yet read. Of course, I'm going to have to find it, right? Um, it's called High School is a Dying Dog. There's a lot of dead dogs in this um, manuscript. Okay. High school is remembered by the dying dog. The dead girl and I are smoking pot by a rotting stream beneath a suburban overpass when the lost dog approaches us. We make up a silly name for him. We call him Topsy. We blow pot smoke into his nostrils. We don't even bother to see if he's wearing an identification tag. He is alone. He needs us. We cuddle him. He runs away back into the woods. We call after him. Topsy, Topsy. Our giggles flicker into the air like the light on and off the dark water where we sit beside the mossy concrete, listen to the thrums of cars driving over us overhead. Somewhere in this afternoon, there is an endless spring. It stretches and stretches until only the dark sky tells us it's time to go home. We laugh like we're drunk. We laugh a laugh that rolls a barrel of ink emptying itself out onto the slow street. Now Topsy, a small white dog, is gone. He's run away from us. He's scurried into the folds of the bushes. And this one is on um, high school industrial arts. The lesson today is someone always gets hurt. Will it be you or another fool? This is a choice. We provide the tools and materials, the saws, the wood, nails, and supervision. Fall not now in love, for it is merely a distraction from your assignment. Now, create this uninspired name plaque. Build stacks of unstable shelves. Lament your lack of craft as the heat of your lust forms in vaporous pools on the floor just below your work table. You thought this class would mean an easy credit. Welcome to our workhouse. No one leaves this building whole. Consider now how this building's roof's akin to the lid of a jar tightly screwed, and you're, in the, you're the inhabitant within. You're scrabbling at its glass, yet we've punched no holes in that aforementioned lid. Now make something. 
Make something no one can use that no one wants. Don't ask why, it builds character. Someday you'll look back on these days fondly. Here are your goggles. There's the eye rinsing station. No, this is not art. Ladies, stand back. We don't want you cutting those pretty fingers off or sawing yourselves in half. This is a man's work. You, wipe that smirk off your face. Last thing I need is one of you girls dying on my watch. So, um, I'm going to read this poem. Um, you know, this is, poem is kind of, the more I think about it, it's uh, the last poem I really finished, and it's kind of, I've been, I've been trying to write for years um, a poem called Yellow Rubber Gloves. Yellow Rubber Gloves, right? This is what I ended up with. I think they're really actually very, uh, uh, that I could not live without them in terms of washing dishes. And when you wash a lot of dishes, it's like you need them. So, but you'll see. Yellow Rubber Gloves. And I'll read two more poems after this. Sisters, why bother? The telling is done. I once fancied myself censure, sweeping floors with my tails as my arms sunk deep into dishwater, half lost, indeed, looking almost as if they had been clean lopped off, mopping up all that blood, rusty strings on the mop, dragging their fat hairs along the linoleum. I'm never surprised when someone calls me lady, though they may as well call me a cleaning lady, though I know they mean lady, as in, what the hell do you think you're doing, lady? I am merely washing dishes, yours. It makes me want to give in, adopt those dozen cats. It makes me nervous enough to count how many cigarettes I've got left. I've seen the lines inching across my face. I'm wise enough to know no great plans are afoot. I've no hope of launching any ships. And besides, I'm done with beauty. They say the hands go first, then the eyes. Then you get a little pinched, whiskery around the lips. I'm not adverse to invisibility. I'm already used to getting shoved aside anyway, sitting small as a pin between men spreading their legs on packed subways. I'm the blunt cunt who should have known long ago it's about time I shut my fucking hole. But bring my hands deep into suds. Watch me muck with the dirt of men's dishes. You'll see I really know what I'm doing. My advice, yellow rubber gloves will save your hands, young bitches. Awful twats who think you'll never be me. Trust me as I never trusted myself. We're in this together. Look at your hands. Who else did you think he had in mind, undermining your time by leaving dish after dirty dish behind? And try using a milder solution. It may bubble up less, but being less caustic, the fewer skin cells it destroys. Who do you sleep beside? Also, lotion is important. Apply it just after washing dishes and every night before you go to bed. Such a nasty poem, isn't it? Um, there's like a lot of unpleasant. I, th- I think, of course, it's all delightfully funny. But then, um, actually, a friend of mine is here, and, and, and she read the whole thing, and she was just like, "This is very dark." I was like, "Really?" Um, so okay, so let's see. Um, I'm going to read the poem called "Poem for an Awful Girl." As long as we're being awful. Um, it's like one of those like, poems where like, you want to like, kill another woman type of thing to get her out of the way. Poem for an awful girl. This is, I'll read one more after this. I'll hand her his heave-ho. I offer an extra arm, give her a golden drip of fat to ring itself round the mantle of her hips. Then I'll trigger a slight tick that tugs insistent below her lowly left eye, her moo-cow look. And if I've spared her a spidering of veins along her thick thighs, it's merely because I'm feeling kind. I return to needle the canvas I've lately been stitching for a pillow upon which I've decided his head will eventually lie. I've been stitching her for a long time outside this room, as I've been imagining her tossing her sneer off from behind, she who considers herself the candelabra losing its fuse to every darkening room she's leaving behind. And yes, it's with a gasp that I consider how she cannot know this yet, how this knowledge shall someday soon become, unbecome her face, as does a most unwelcome announcement, such as that regarding an imminent flood made to a town's mayor. But I'm getting ahead of myself here, because there is, in fact, no reason she should care, and this is likely the gist of it. I'm not even a shadow in the corner of her room. I am now stitching in a room belonging to any other house owned by any other landlord who owns any other house she is presently residing in. 
I could sit here all afternoon, scratch my crotch while plotting her death, and no one would care. Worse, not even her. Were it not for such precarious boredoms, their weighty responsibilities, the pastime of needlecraft would not have been invented for women to push their disenchantments through a painted canvas with thickest needle late into the night, stitching deep. If I had an extra arm, I'd move faster on this project, I lament. My pillow shall a flower depict. Um, and this last poem is called, um, it's called Epistle Many Pronged. Epistle being a letter, right? Mortification, I've known your corpse lips. I've undone your pants, reached in to make balloon animals. Once I twisted you a pink and silver rabbit-eared hat. You squeaked. I swore I'd someday swin burn you. Later, slumped over and listless on that bench in the train station, I swore I could feel you as you walked hurriedly past. Always know I do not consider you obliged to return this ugliness to my return address. This epistle requiring a special envelope, one of fashion to accommodate its many bristles, a sort of crate that allows it to continually stake its blooms outward throughout postal transit, a flight that allows its origami hothouse of hatreds to arrive, serve up its towering ups on the simple, on the seemingly unspecified afternoon upon your doorstep. It never was a simple plant, like most bad thoughts, first it grew untended, loved, loved being a weed beast. Like a nasty glance, it rose unbidden, as if it had come into its own as soon as it was born. Yet it had the sense to shrink when meticulous neighbors began eyeing it by the gate in hopes of trimming it back, so my lawn might appear to have more order. I always suspected it had a silence it worked itself toward, in a manner seeds germinate in the dark, in the same way a sack of potatoes will grow raw hairs inside the cabinets that sit beneath our kitchen sinks. Before long it buckled the sidewalk, suffering me a week-long headache just in figuring out how many stamps a ten-pound plant requires, carefully wrapping it so it arrive undamaged. Do its fronds now reach down into that joyously peopled square you cordoned off inside yourself, back when I proffered the paw of my hand? You yourself, being also peopled with demons, will no doubt understand the lengths that I went to, ensuring it remain intact throughout its transit. Thanks. Thanks.